Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Mia Whitaker. Thank you for joining us for today's U3 webinar. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items to make note of. For the duration of today's meeting, participants will be muted. If you have a question or questions for either of our presenters, please submit them using the chat function. Feel free to indicate the presenter to whom your question should be directed. Today's event will be recorded. Closed captioning is also available. To use the closed captioning, feature, there's a pop-up button next to the record button on your screen. Click to enable it. To open today's event, we have our director um, from the Office of Research on Women's Health, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Janine Clayton. Dr. Clayton. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, the Associate Director for Research on Women's Health here at the National Institutes of Health. For 30 years, the Office of Research on Women's Health has been part of NIH's efforts to put science to work for the health of women, including addressing issues of critical public health concern. For example, in the United States, significant racial disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality continue to exist. CDC data show that Black, African American, American Indian, Alaska Native women are two to three times more likely to die for pregnancy-related causes um, as non-Hispanic white women, a difference, that, a difference that cannot be entirely explained by individual level factors, such as age, socioeconomic status, and education. CDC reported that the pregnancy-related mortality rate for Black women with at least a college degree is 5.2 times that of their white counterpart. This is particularly disturbing since most pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. Together with the 27 NIH institutes and centers, ORWH supports integrated research that studies the drivers of these disparities and seeks to develop and test interventions to improve care quality and equity standards, treatment satisfaction, and ultimately maternal and infant outcomes. One such effort is a new initiative called IMPROVE, which stands for Implementing a Maternal Health and Pregnancy Outcomes Vision for Everyone. ORWH indeed recognizes the need to address disparities in women's health with strategic efforts. One of the ways that we do this is through the U3 Administrative Supplement Program. This program, which is titled Research on the Health of Women of Understudied, Underrepresented, and Underreported Populations, or U3, stimulates interdisciplinary research on the complex issues affecting the health of women who are in populations that are often understudied, underrepresented and underreported in biomedical research and in surveillance and other reporting statistics. We are very proud of this unique program. To amplify the program's work, annually U3 hosts a women's health lecture series. In today's session, our invited speakers, Drs. Marie Lynn Miranda and Dr. Leah Rubin will explore how social, economic, and physical conditions in the environment influence health, and discuss strategies used to intervene on those conditions to improve outcomes in chronic disease. This rich discussion will include lessons learned that, are learned that are relevant to research and clinical practice. Before we hear from our esteemed panelists, Dr. Mia Whitaker will give you a brief overview of the U3 program. Dr. Whitaker? Thank you, Dr. Clayton. As you know, today's event is brought to you by ORWH's Understudied, Underrepresented, and Underreported Program. The purpose of the U3 Administrative Supplement Program is to stimulate, promote, and accelerate state-of-the-art and cutting-edge research to address the complex issues affecting the health of women across the life course. The program encourages and funds interdisciplinary research focused on the effect of sex and gender influences at the intersection of social determinants of health, including but not limited to race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, education, and more. The program has made 49 awards since its inception. The, the topic for today's Excuse me. The topic of today's U3 Women's Health Lecture Series will be improving chronic disease outcomes through approaches that address social determinants of health and will include presentations by Drs. Marie Lynn Miranda and Leah Rubin, as Dr. Clayton mentioned. My colleague, Dr. Rajari Roy, will introduce our panelists. Dr. Roy. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. 
It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Mari Lynn Miranda. Dr. Miranda specialized in research on environmental and public health, especially how the environmental shapes health and well being among children. She is the founding director of the Children's Environmental Health Initiative. Second slide, please. Research, education, and outreach program committed to the fostering environment where all people can prosper. She is a leader in the rapidly evolving field of geospatial health informatics. Dr. Miranda has applied spatial analytic approaches to a wide range of scientific issues with an emphasis on how social and environmental exposures jointly drive health disparities. She is a Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude graduate of Duke University, where she earned her AB in mathematics and economics and was named a Truman Scholar. She has a PhD and MA from Harvard University, where she held a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of Sigma Xi. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Miranda. Dr. Miranda. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, y'all at ORWH need to stop sharing so that I can share my screen. Uh, great. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. I am also grateful for the opportunity uh, to participate in this webinar. Uh, those of you who are sitting on the webinar may have noticed that we switched order. There have been a few technical glitches and so hopefully uh, my technology has worked out and soon Dr. Rubin's technology will be worked out as well. So I'm gonna talk about residential segregation, in particular residential racial segregation, but a little bit more broadly, and how it shapes health and well-being. Before I do that, however, I wanna make four key observations. The first one of which is that health is spatially patterned. So if you look at this uh, Northwestern corner graphic right here, this comes from the CDC, and it's a measure of the uh, intensity of the numbers of people uh, in any given county that have are 65 and older and have 66 or more chronic health conditions. So this is a map that comes from the CDC. You can see that amongst the older population, there's a concentration in particular geographies of people with uh, multiple, uh, multiple chronic health conditions. So, and you, clearly you can see the spatial pattern. The second observation is that contributors to health are spatially patterned. So this map right here, which is also from the CDC, is a map of the percent of people who uh, have no more than a high school education. So again, you see that there's a spatial pattern where lower levels of educational attainment occur more commonly in certain areas of the country. And of course, you can zoom in and look at individual states and see all the local heterogeneity. My third observation is that healthcare resources are spatially patterned. This middle map here is of the state of North Carolina. Uh, the yellow areas, this was work that we did with the Kellogg Eye Center uh, at the University of Michigan actually. Uh, and we were looking at access to eye care for young children uh, as it related to strabismus and amblyopia. Um, so what we discovered here, the yellow areas are places where uh, individuals with families live within a 30 minute drive time to an ophthalmologic specialist. And the red areas are, uh, as you go into the deeper red, the eye care access is, is declining. So my fourth observation is that geographic scale matters. So this map right here is a map of primary care provider accessibility that's mapped at the county level. So here, the darker the color, the lower the accessibility to primary care. So in general, in these maps, the darker the color, the worse the outcome. So what if you then, instead of looking at things at the county level where it seems like, boy, everything is looking pretty good east of the Mississippi River, if you instead map it at the ZICTA, which is kind of like zip code, but not quite, but for these purposes, we can just think about it as mapping at the zip code level, 
you can see that it looks quite different. So first of all, this area where it seems like there's very low accessibility, there's actually a lot of public land. So I don't think we care too much whether there is a primary care provider available in Joshua Tree National Park. Um, but you can see as well that there are certainly areas on the, you know, even east of the Mississippi, uh, where east of the Mississippi, where there's significant problems with access to healthcare. So with that being said, I wanna focus uh, in this discussion of social correlates of health. I always like to call it social correlates because uh, it's not deterministic. If it were deterministic, you know, myself and any number of other scientists I know wouldn't be uh, doing the work that we're doing right now. So I wanna focus on racial residential segregation as an important uh, component of social correlates of health. Uh, the reason that I wanna focus on it is uh, Dr. Rubin is gonna talk about a whole series of different social factors that are important in shaping people's health. Uh, we believe that racial residential segregation actually provides like a collector variable because places that are residentially segregated are less likely to have access to good food sources, are more likely to have higher crime, are more likely to have lower income. So it's a you know, single collective measure of how disamenities or stressors tend to, file up in, uh, tend to pile up in particular areas. Racial residential segregation is commonly defined by five distinct dimensions, evenness, isolation, concentration, centralization, and clustering. I'm not gonna go into the differences amongst these, but we focus in particular on isolation. And the reason that we, fo we focus on isolation is because we think that is the, that the way that you measure isolation is the best way to get at this idea that several disadvantageous factors might be piling up in particular communities. Racial isolation has been linked, as it says here on the slide, with infant and adult mortality, poor pregnancy outcomes, type two diabetes, hypertension, and poor cardiovascular health. I'm not actually, from now on, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how to construct these types of indices and how they might be used in analyses. So this is a map of racial residential isolation in the United States where blue colors indicate that racial isolation is low. And this is in particular racial isolation of non-Hispanic blacks in our country. So that index can vary between zero and one. If, the, if, the, if it's very low, it means that uh, blacks are not racially isolated in those communities. If it's, uh, if it's very high, close to one, it shows up as yellow and it means that those are very racially isolated neighborhoods. So blacks are living in predominantly black uh, neighborhoods and that's when we start to see the pileup of these disamenities and social stressors. So you can see there's a very clear pattern of higher levels of racial isolation across the southeastern United States. If I put up for you a map of the stroke belt in the United States, it wouldn't look all that different uh, from this. Uh, this is also very similar to if I put up a map on of uh, where slaves were held in our country uh, starting 400 years ago, the map, there, there would be some similarities in intensity as well. So in addition to doing racial residential isolation, we also looked at um, we also looked at educational attainment residential isolation. So the idea here is if I have uh, uh, what is the likelihood that if I live in a particular neighborhood that I will be interacting with people who have a college degree or more. So in no way do we believe that rubbing shoulders with somebody who's white or rubbing shoulders with somebody who has a higher degree is gonna somehow or another inoculate you. But what we do think happens is that when you have these different compositions in the neighborhoods, the likelihood that politicians and other decision makers are gonna pay attention and, uh, uh, and ensure that those places stay enfranchised uh, becomes different. So you can see here that the pattern of educational attainment is very different from the pattern of uh, residential of uh, racial isolation. So educational isolation uh, we see piles up predominantly in rural areas. It's very much more of a factor of an urban rural divide. Um, and if you look at the correlation between racial isolation and educational isolation, here, they are more correlated in places that uh, are flashing up as bright red, and they are uh, correlated in the negative direction. They move in opposite directions in areas that are flashing blue. We see a lot more in yellow and red on this map, obviously. It's very important when you look at this correlation to figure out, well, 
um, why are they positively correlated? Down here, it, as it turns out, they're positively correlated because both racial isolation and educational isolation are high. Uh, for example, in Maine, however, they're highly correlated because racial isolation and educational isolation are both low. So if you wanna zoom in a little bit on a few communities, here's Kansas City, Missouri, racial isolation and educational isolation, Los Angeles, racial and educational, the Raleigh-Durham area in North Carolina, racial isolation and educational isolation. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is what if I focus on racial isolation? I'm gonna forget about ed educational isolation for now and I just wanna look at racial isolation and see how it's changed over time. So here's a map of the United States um, where uh, low levels of racial isolation are in dark blue and it goes all the way from dark blue to yellow. And so yellow are areas where racial isolation is quite high. So this is what the map looked like in 1990. And this is what the map looks like in 2015. So if your, your mind's eye looks at this and says, boy, it looks like there's been a little bit of dimming of the yellow in the bottom map. So maybe that means that racial isolation is uh, getting better. We're becoming a, a less residentially segregated place. It is important, however, to be able to uh, not just you know, determine thing by your mind's eye. So here's another way to display the data, which shows you histograms. And the uh, lighter gray is what the histogram looked like. Uh, I'm sorry, the darker gray is what the histogram looked like in 1990. And the lighter gray is what the histogram looks like in 2015. So here's residential uh, racial uh, isolation from low racial isolation to high racial isolation. And if I were really able to zoom in here, you would see at every point along the curve of this histogram, it's shifted to the right, which means that on average, racial isolation has increased in the United States between 1990 and 2015, although it has increased in some places and decreased in other places. But on average, it has increased. So then if I wanna take this, and give you sort of a better example of where it's, a better uh, visualization of where it's increased and where it's decreased, I can do, I can do these map subtractions. And here, um, uh, this kind of burnt sienna color is where racial isolation is increasing. And this blue color is places where racial isolation is decreasing. So you can see there's kind of a watercolor wash of some, of some you know, orange and burnt sienna across the country and other places where you see a bit of a watercolor wash of, of the uh, purple, so decreasing racial isolation. Some places where racial isolation has decreased quite a bit and some hot spots where it seems like maybe it's increased quite a bit. So uh, you get that sense across the entire tract. And if you then want to subdivide this by different regions of the country, for the continental United States, there are 72,899 census tracts. And we decided, well, we're gonna say, we're gonna say if the change was between minus 0.025 to plus 0.025, which means that either, which for all practical purposes means it got about two and a half percent more isolated or two and a half percent less isolated, then we're gonna say, well, that's racial isolation has been relatively stable over time not that stable states of residential segregation are good. Um, and then if you wanna see racial isolation in places where it's decreasing over time, uh, you go over here to the, these two right columns and places where it's increasing over time. What you can see in the United States is, about, is that about 57% of the census tracts, uh, this racial isolation was stable over time. And it's about 14% where it decreased over time adding up these two columns, and it's 30% where it's increasing over time. Uh, and that, if you break it down into different regions of the United States, you see different patterns where uh, the, the, um, the Mideast, for example, is a place where you see quite a bit of, um, uh, I'm sorry, you see quite a bit of uh, decrease in racial isolation over time, but it's also one of the places where you see the most increase in racial isolation over time. So different census tracts are doing different things. This provides an opportunity for people to look at different policy measures that were taken in these different communities to see what's driving things. 
So again, it's pretty useful to zoom in on a few cities. So this is the city of Atlanta. Uh, this is what the racial isolation map looked like in 1990. Again, blue is low levels of racial isolation, yellow is high levels of racial isolation. Uh, and uh, this is what the map looks like in 2015. If I then do that subtraction map to find out where did it increase and where did it decrease, there's this U-shaped curve in Atlanta where there's substantial increases in racial uh, racial isolation, um, and if you, uh, if I blew these curves up, you would see that there's a substantial shift to the right for the, met the Atlanta metropolitan statistical area. Similar thing happening in Baltimore. Uh, here you can see this is the 1990 map graphic. This is the 2015, and here's the change to it. Again, there's a rightward shift in the histogram, and here's an example of St. Louis. Uh, clearly an increase in racial isolation. I intentionally picked a few places where we've seen uh, issues related to uh, 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 policing practices and criminal justice uh, practices that have been concerning and have been uh, erupting all over the country. We, could, we can, for anybody who's interested, we're happy to zoom in on any particular metropolitan statistical area. That being so, this is a, these are a series of data that are available uh, to, first of all, to get linked to health outcomes, right? So you can link these patterns to health outcomes and see to what extent is racial isolation driving health outcomes. We have, we have linked this to multiple health, comes, health outcomes. Every time we do it, it is always a significant predictor. The other thing that you can do is you can take this and understand how did we end up at these patterns of racial isolation depending upon what the housing policies or the zoning policies were in particular areas. So it's a useful set of tools for re uh, retrospectively understanding what policies led to more or less racial isolation and it's a prospective tool for being able to understand how does where we are today with racial isolation predict the health and well-being of communities. So that being said, I want to encourage as a final message that we shouldn't just be downloading data, we should be uploading re results in ways that are accessible and actionable. So all of these data are freely available um, there. Well, we, I just moved to the University of Notre Dame, so our website is not yet active, but if you send me an email, I'm happy to share these data with you to use in whatever analyses you would like to do. Uh, and we are working with a variety of policymakers in understanding the uh, racial isolation in their communities. I'd like to just uh, thank the, uh, my CHI, the CHI team for all of the good work that they do to make this possible. Our funders, our data partners, uh, there aren't any research participants on this particular, these particular projects I showed you, but in general, they help uh, make us stronger scientists. And of course, the offices of research at the universities where I spent time. And I'll just conclude in my acknowledgements by thanking my family. So I feel that I'm a better scientist every day for the support and love that they provide to me. And with that, I will turn it back over. I will stop sharing and turn it back over to uh, our organizers to introduce Dr. Rubin. Thank you. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our second speaker. Dr. Leah Rubin. Dr. Rubin is an associate professor of neurology, psychiatry, behavioral sciences, and epidemiology at John Hopkins University. Dr. Rubin received her BA from Franklin and Marshall College and MA in clinical psychology from Loyola University, Maryland, and a PhD and MPH from University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Rubin's work is dedicated to improving the cognitive and mental health of several vulnerable populations, including women and men living with HIV, both nationally and more recently internationally, individuals with serious mental illness, people with dementia, and those with traumatic brain injury. Her broad training background allows her to use interdisciplinary approaches in her research program that incorporates epidemiological, mechanistic, and intervention science. Dr. Rubin's epidemiologic and mechanistic studies have been primarily conducted in the Women's Interagency HIV Study, 
She has also worked within other large-scale cohort studies, including the CNS HIV antiretroviral therapy effects research cohort study. Now, I will turn it over to Dr. Rubin. All right, let's hope the technical glitches are not still occurring. Um, so I'm going to briefly share my screen. If not, I'm going to hopefully let you open it and then I'll just say next screen. So thank you. Um, I think I'm just going to let you do this because I'm not sure, are you seeing uh, the actual slides or? We're seeing the workspace in uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. So is it okay if you open my slides and I just tell you next? Apologies. This was... That's all fine. No worries. All right. But I did want to say um, before I start, thank you for the opportunity to present as part of um, this panel today. And um, also to thank you to ORWH. Uh, I come from uh, UIC and had a birch there. And so sex differences and the support that you've given, that you've provided uh, has really led me on this scientific trajectory um, as well as my ability for mentoring. So um, today I'm going to share with you uh, a bit about um, illustrating the importance of social determinants in women, particularly those of minority status uh, in the context of HIV. So if you can go to the next slide. So as I come to you from an epidemiologic perspective, I like to start by setting the stage and first just defining my problem area. As many people may not be as familiar with uh, central nervous dysfunction in the context of HIV. And I'm going to be using the term CNS dysfunction as an umbrella term for both cognition as well as mental health. Next slide. So the classic picture that we think of CNS dysfunction very early in the epidemic is actually depicted by uh, Tony Kushner's play, Angels in America. And one of the main characters actually fell into an HIV associated dementia and was cared for by his partner. And so a lot of the classic symptoms included issues of memory, gait difficulty, mental slowing, depressive symptoms, and in some cases, delirium. And, and this character actually was hallucinating um, with and seeing angels. And I think it's really important that the key factors contributing to the AIDS epidemic early on and, and consequently CNS system dysfunction uh, were homophobia and lack of access to medical care. Next slide. Well, times are changing. So if we think about the, the kind of classic picture, that would have come very early on in the epidemic. And as of 1996 was the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy. And as that came online, effective art and availability started to increase. Next slide. While science, and then uh, concurrent with the increase of availability of art, we slowly started to see a decrease in uh, disease severity, uh, the decrease of incidence of HIV associated dementia, uh, decreases in HIV viral influence on the central nervous system. So what does this mean for the clinical picture of CNS dysfunction? Next slide. So if we think of early on uh, when, we, when we saw more of the HIV associated dementia, the more severe forms, that was kind of pre-ART. And what we've now seen with effective ART is the shift. We don't see the, as severe of a picture anymore. Yet, even with effective antiretrovirals and with the case that people are virally suppressed, we, cognitive impairment still pers persists. But what predominates are the mild forms of cognitive impairment. And what we also see is considerable heterogeneity in the clinical presentation of cognitive impairment. What one person with HIV experiences cognitively can differ considerably from what another person may experience. But it comes to question, what places people in the yellow box and actually the white box, now that the virus is, for most people, if they're adhering to their medication, under, in, uh, under control? So next slide. All right. So among people with HIV, what contributes to central nervous system dysfunction? Let's suppose that we're to walk into a room of 100 people. 
all of who have HIV and all of whom have cognitive dysfunction. And in this case, let's think of uh, women who are uh, of minority status. Of them, how many would you think would have cognitive impairments specifically related to HIV? Well, our work in the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which you briefly heard in the introduction, which is the nation's largest longitudinal study of the natural and treated history of women with HIV. What we initially saw in, um, in 2015 was that the answer would be six. So six out of 100 would have um, suggested they would have had a cognitive impairment due to HIV. So, but yet, what are, um, so HIV affects 6% of the individuals in differences in cognition, yet 50% are affected. So why is that the case? Next slide. Well, this is where I think social determinants comes into play. Social determinants are key factors uh, that, that may be playing into effect here, but then also we need to think about, we're thinking of social determinants as well of individuals with a chronic illness. And so we may see interactions between these social determinants and HIV to influence cognition. So next slide. So just to give a very big picture, and again, I was supposed to go first but with the technical difficulties, um, what I wanted to show are just, in general, what are social determinants of health? And, and again, uh, given the first talk, we should really be calling these social correlates of health, and it really refers to these overlapping social structures and economic systems, whether we're thinking of the social environment, physical environment, health services, structural and societal factors that may be responsible for most, most health inequities. Next slide. But it's not just that we're thinking in terms of um, social determinants. This is social determinants in the context of a chronic illness, specifically HIV. And again, that the combination of the two may even lead to greater negative effects on central nervous system dysfunction. Next slide. So the conceptual model um, that I'm working with is if we think of social determinants on the left hand of the slide, and we can think of things like poverty, education, gender inequity, stigma, racism, as well as things that occur in early childhood experience, such as trauma. Social determinants um, may influence central nervous dysfunction directly, but it also, as you can see with the arrow that I, um, that social determinants may also put you at risk for HIV infection. So you may engage, find folks in engaging in risky behaviors, which leads to HIV infection. And once infected, um, HIV, even if uh, the virus is controlled with ART, there can still be low levels of inflammation, which may also play into central nervous system dysfunction. Next slide. And what I'd like to do is make the argument that women with HIV may be more cognitively vulnerable or are more vulnerable to CNS dysfunction than men with HIV due to many of these social determinants, including poverty, low literacy levels, low education, a lot of the early life stressors and trauma, barriers to, to healthcare. And we've demonstrated in our work that women are more likely to fall into these categories than men. So essentially, we see social determinants of, of health intersection with biological sex and gender, as well as the virus. Next slide. Yet I think what's absolutely, uh, what's fascinating is yet prior to actually 2009, when the WISE actually, we integrated a comprehensive uh, neuropsychological test battery to assess cognitive function, um, prior to that, you can see here that the studies early on either comprised of, you know, they were small samples of women. And if you look outside of samples that have, uh, studies that have just focused on women, um, looking at HIV and CNS dysfunction, they focused on all men or predominantly all men. And it, this is, again, focusing on women, again, becomes critical, not because of just social determinants, but because of the epidemic that's changed over time that's um, in the United States to impact women, primarily women of color. And if you go to the next slide, I just pulled um, the, uh, did you go to the next slide? There we go. Um, from the CDC. 
So you can see the HIV surveillance data, again, to just show that as of 2018, Black, African American, and Hispanic Latinos accounted for, in fact, 69% of HIV diagnoses. So next slide. And again, thinking in terms of social determinants in the context of women with HIV, this is data, again, coming from the Ys. And the Ys is very representative of the epidemic in the United States. And you can see here that on the left-hand side, I'm showing you data um, from women who have their, their, they have good disease control. And on the right hands, they're not virally suppressed. And you can see here that 71% uh, are black non-Hispanic, about 12% Hispanic. Income levels, 50, almost 50% 50 are making less than $12,000 a year. And you can see that the unemployment rates are quite high. Next slide. So now thinking in terms of what contributes to central nervous system dysfunction in people with HIV, we took data from the Ys recently and identified again people, women who are showing cognitive impairment and those who aren't. And then using machine learning approaches to identify which factors distinguish those who are impaired to unimpaired. And what you can see here that are shown in red are social determinants. We can think of the clinic site of, of where uh, people are living, education. While race isn't exactly one, it's linked with a number of social determinants employment. And if you go to the next slide, some of the other factors that populate um, uh, that are now shown in green are all things that social determinants may be impacting, right? Social determinants could influence uh, body mass index and BMI has been linked with cognitive function. Uh, it can also be linked to depressive symptoms, which again lead to uh, cognitive impairment. Next slide. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, when we talk about CNS, it's not just cognition, but it's also mental health and that the social determinants play into this as well. And just to give you a feel of the prevalence of mental health disorders, and again, this is data from the Ys and just over a thousand women. This is over uh, within the past 12 months, and this is our study population relative to the general US population. So estimates are quite high. And then again, across the lifetime. Next slide. And I think what even becomes uh, more interesting, so we took the data um, that was uh, collected as part of uh, R01 by Judith Cook and just took those kind of basic categories of anxiety, mood, and substance use disorders. And if you look on the outskirts, it's only about 36% of women who show these issues only show one of them. And that what you can see is that there is a significant degree of overlap in that it's not just one aspect that these women are experiencing, but it's uh, in fact multiple. Next slide. And I also want to mention that as we think about this, we need to think of the effects of social determinants across the lifespan. So um, from childhood all the way to adulthood, we can think of education, toxin exposure, neglect, abuse, childhood trauma, all of these things are gonna in, going to influence brain health. If you go to the next slide. So honing in specifically, because I do a lot of work with respect to trauma, and one of the aspects of social determinants is what goes on during early development. And so here, and what we did is identified women essentially whether they experienced trauma very early on and they uh, showed they had mental health issues such as uh, mood and anxiety disorders combined with substance use disorders. Um, folks who may have had trauma later on during their teens, again, combination with mental health and substance use issues and other groups. What you can see if you're focusing in on the black line in specifically that if you've experienced early trauma combined, which may lead to a lot of these mental health issues, over time, you're at increased risk for cognition globally. Next slide. And there's also, when we think of it, there's an underlying neurobiology here, both outside and within the context of HIV. 
So on the left hand side, I pulled imaging studies uh, that have either focused on the top childhood trauma, on the second, uh, second down or studies that have focused on depression and all the way at the bottom, post-traumatic stress disorder. All of these things um, have been shown to influence brain function, specifically uh, a circuitry uh, that engages the prefrontal cortex, which is very important for holding data in mind, updating information, coordinating behavior, guiding thinking. And it's linked with uh, the limbic system or amygdala, which is important for regulating emotion. So in the case of trauma, depression, PTSD, we see um, the decrease of our ability for, of our prefrontal cortex to work and an increase in our limbic system. And so the circuitry is altered. And then on the right hand side, what you're seeing is now we're looking at stress in, in particular in the context of HIV. And again, it's um, tacking on into the exact same brain regions. Next slide. So there's really, you know, a biological instantiation of these social determinants of health, I think, in HIV. So if you look at kind of the social determinant circle, so this is everything that we're thinking of that may influence um, brain function directly. And then also we have alterations in a lot of, it's from a systems biology approach, our stress response system, inflammation, our gut microbiome, all plays into this. Now that's even thinking outside of the context of HIV. HIV I have on, on the bottom corner, and HIV can cross the blood-brain barrier, get in the brain. It can cause um, inter, uh, inflammation in the brain. And so all of these things together uh, may be very problematic. So next slide. So what are we doing? Thinking about a health system response to social determinants of CNS dysfunction in people with HIV. So next slide. So if we go back to the conceptual model that I showed early on, what we're trying to do at this point in time is really attenuate or remove the link in many cases between CNS dysfunction that's impacting some of the social determinants that we may be able to uh, change with respect to poverty, healthcare access, et cetera. And the next slide. And what we've been doing, um, and this is collaboration with um, Joan uh, Severson, Tom Marcotte at UCSD. Uh, Joan is at Digital Artifacts, and this is in the context of our, um, the Bartlett Clinic at Johns Hopkins with Richard Moore and Carrie Althoff, that we have been um, leveraging technology, using iPads and assessing both cognition as well as mental health and incorporating this into routine HIV outpatient clinical care. Um, and you can see here, I'm just showing about how long it takes. And then at, at the bottom here, um, what the kind of cognitive burden is globally within our, our clinic, it's about 25%. And that's you know looking at around 400 individuals. Or, I mean, this is continued work. We're now um, not just assessing people uh, initially, but uh, following them up over time. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand side as we're assessing uh, mental health issues. And the, the nice part about both of these tools is that we get um, answers in real time. So if somebody pops up as suicidal, we're not, we're not letting them walk out the door. We're, they're directly linked with our psychiatric services. So we're able to monitor, we're able to help, and then hopefully that will kind of feed back and, and break the cycle. And on the last slide, um, again, as we think about this entire panel on improving chronic disease outcomes through approaches that address social determinants on health, and this is some modification of a slide by uh, Bob Remian that he presented at CROI in 2019, that if we think of the HIV um, treatment cascade, uh, if there is, you know, the, the, what we're looking for is to identify all of the new infections and then of those who are infected, we want to make sure that they're diagnosed, they are linked to care, retained in care, they're prescribed their medication, and they remain undetectable. Now you can imagine that any cognitive mental health issues will impact every part of this treatment cascade, you, you know, from 
uh, delayed our lack of HIV testing care initiation, poor retention in care. And so tracking, monitoring, and handling these issues is going to be of particular importance um, given the, the UNAIDS goal of a 90-90-90. Of, you know, the goal is to get um, of people living with HIV, or those who are infected, we want to know their diagnosis, 90% of those that are in treatment, 90% of those that are virally suppressed. And the final slide is just to acknowledge, um, you know, my collaborators. So again, I started this journey um, back at UIC uh, with Pauline Mackey, Judith Cook, and the Birch, um, and then uh, since moved to uh, John Hopkins and our brain health program that we've been developing over the past few years. And I really uh, can't thank uh, NIH enough for really supporting uh, this line of work. Um, and also we've been engaged with uh, community organizations Max Wise, which is the, now the Max Wise Combined Cohort Study and all of the, the, the participants that we uh, work with. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Um, now we're gonna transition into a question and answer uh, session um, and I will facilitate that. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Rubin. Um, the first question is, um, uh, as you know, for women in health disparities populations in particular, the exposure to multiple stressors can have cumulative effects, maximizing HIV related risks. In several international studies, there's been some evidence of social protection interventions such as educational and housing support food vouchers as a means to mitigate the negative impacts of HIV, contribute to HIV prevention, and potentially remove social and economic barriers to accessing treatment. Tell us about your efforts in your clinical practice to actively combine programs to increase the availability, uptake, and adherence to prescribed therapeutics, um, including technology-based interventions among women with HIV. So thank you for that question. And I think that's kind of where the last piece of my talk is really what we're trying to do is uh, integrate, uh, I think part of this is assessment in routine clinic care, identifying uh, where the problems are, and then being able to, to better help these folks. Um, so typically this isn't done in the context of our ID clinics. Um, you know, our goal is to get them uh, virally suppressed on their medications, but again, we need to know where the the CNS dysfunction, where the problems lie, and then hopefully um, act on them in real time. Dr. Whitaker, you're queuing up another question for us. Maybe I'm mute. Hi, yes, sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. No um, worries. This next question is for Dr. Miranda. The American College of Physicians acknowledges the role of social determinants or social correlates of health and examines the complexities associated with them. They offer recommendations on better integration of social determinants into healthcare and research. Can you talk a bit about um, customized approaches, for example, targeting seg segregation to address issues hindering health equity with respect to chronic disease? I know uh, this is a big question, so feel yeah. free to adjust and, and tailor. Yeah. So I think uh, <clears throat> there's been a couple of things that are happening that, uh, that to me hold a lot of promise for how things might change and uh, might be changing in the future going forward. So first of all, in health centers, they are, in, you know, health centers are using electronic health records right now. And uh, we have worked with a number of uh, health systems on uh, turning their electronic health records or their data warehouse for their electronic health records and turning them into spatially referenced databases. So we help them take all of their patients and locate them in, in space and, and uh, stop, we've gotten them out of the habit of overwriting addresses so you can see how addresses have changed over time. And <clears throat> once you, uh, it, if you take people's addresses and you geo-reference them so you can, you can see where on the map these people are located, I can then attach a whole bunch of social correlates of health data. So if you can imagine, here's all the patient data. I don't know if people can see my video. Here's all the patient data on one side. 
there's this fulcrum right here, which is their address. And then here's all this social correlates of health data. And you can link them, you can link them together via that shared geography. So um, we worked, for example, um, with, uh, when I was at Duke, we worked with uh, the health, uh, the, with Duke Medicine to develop a tailored diabetes intervention program where you sort of said, okay, here's what we know medically about these patients. Here's what we know socially about these patients. What's the nature of the intervention that we need to roll out to particular individuals in particular communities? So people kind of got binned into intensity of interventions, but also by geography so that the health system could use its resources more commonly. We did something similar with outside of technically outside of the health system around child abuse, where um, we helped uh, take the, we helped sort of develop models that make it, uh, make you understand a little bit where you're likely to see um, what the patterns of child abuse have been, and then say, okay, well, if we have a home nurse visiting program, can we begin interventions even, you know, well, well before there's any possibility of abuse for these children? So you're linking all of these different kinds of data together. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, that the second thing I would say that augurs well for change is that, you know, we're all, you know, using our phones and seeing maps and we're used to thinking about maps more. So I see increasingly community groups, um, politicians, decision makers, uh, city government officials, county government, state officials, et cetera, who want to understand these programs via mapped representations. And so while they may not be able to do statistics or uh, digest these giant tables, all these advances and the visual display of data is helping us make the case for, a, uh, for addressing housing problems for kids with asthma um, or addressing uh, uh, food accessibility in low-income neighborhoods. So. Thank you. Um, so this next question is for uh, Dr. Miranda. Uh, Dr. Miranda, um, in your presentation, you were looking at data about the uh, Middle Eastern portion of the population. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, racial segregation um, and the decrease and increases over the same time um, locally in our area? Uh, which area is that? I think the um, um, respondent is referencing maybe Maryland or uh, um, DC area. <coughs> so I showed the um, zoom in map of the DC Baltimore area. If whoever is asking that question wants to send me their email, I will send them that graphic of the DC Baltimore area. What you see definitely there is that there's this, uh, there's this expansion across the sort of wider DC Baltimore area. There's this expansion of places that are racially isolated. So Baltimore is one of the places where we see a meaningful increase in the amount, it, it, the meaningful increase in racial isolation. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I'm, I'm happy to share that graphic and I'm happy to share data and uh, talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with whomever. Uh, I'll, in the chat box, I'll um, chat to everyone what my email address is, so anybody who wants to ask questions, um, ask questions directly about particular geographies, I'm happy to share. And I'll, I'll add mine as well in case there's any, any specific questions or follow-up after this. Thank you both. Um, it seems that we are running short on time. Um, so I invite um, uh, our participants to continue to submit questions in the uh, chat, bo chat box and we will do our best to create a structure for you to, to get answers to um, the questions that you've proposed, um, uh, proposed in the uh, chat function. Um, we're going to uh, move towards uh, concluding today's session. Um, but before we take uh, this opportunity to end, we want to thank our presenters um, for 
for and the attendees for taking the time to attend our, our meeting today. Your our communications team. We also want to thank them for their contribution and the overall commitment to advance women's health, uh, the health of, of women, including uh, those women who are experiencing health disparities and uh, are otherwise underserved matters. And so do you. So we look forward to additional opportunities to advance women's health. And please go to our website orwh.od.nih.gov and I will display that shortly. I'm sorry my screen is advancing rather slow. And if you'd like the opportunity to subscribe to our Women's Health in Focus at NIH quarterly publication, you can also find information for that on our website. The, the next application date for the U3 administrative supplement, um, the announcement number is NO2. NOT, sorry, OD 20048. It is January 28th in 2020. So please feel free to apply. We'll look forward to receiving your applications. Have a pleasant and productive rest of your day, and we appreciate your support for the work. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.